today we're going to talk about how to show love for others when times are difficult, discouraging, and evil. And we're going to look at uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 14 through 21. And so to begin, let's look at the last verse, verse 21, where the Apostle Paul says to the church in Rome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so what we're doing is we're reading the last page of a novel uh, before we, we read the whole plot. But uh, as we go through this, I think you're going to see that this is, this is a summary. It's an introduction to this passage of scripture, and it's a summary. And so uh, I've used it as an introduction, and we'll say it again at the conclusion. Uh, John Montgomery Boyce said that uh, now we've come upon an even more radical proposal. We are to love our enemies. Paul says that instead of hating those who hate us, we're to love them and pray for them. Even as Christ loved us and prayed for us, bless are th uh, those who persecute you and bless and do not curse was Jesus' instruction to us. When he was invited to uh, address uh, the uh, business uh, uh, department at the uh, Harvard Business School, uh, Chuck Colson uh, was part of this their distinguished lecture series. And uh, he started off his lecture uh, by saying that uh, uh, they couldn't teach ethics at Harvard Business School. And everybody kind of looked at him and, and he said, no, you can't teach ethics because you see ethics the word ethics is ethos from the Greek language, and it means a place. And, and basically, it meant a hiding place. So ethics is what we go to a particular place, and it has particular information. He says, all you can do is teach morals here. And morals is from the word more, which, which really means what you're thinking at that particular time. It really has not a lot to do with anything that is, quote, ethical, because it's changeable. And he says, because all education is based upon relativism, that indeed, you can't teach ethics. Now, that is in opposition to what the Apostle Paul is telling us in verses 14 through 21 of chapter 12. He is talking about ethics. And so as we think about this, recognize that ethics is what we're talking about in these verses, in these seven uh, uh, basic ethical principles that he gives us in these verses. I read out of a, a, a devotional book, Day by Day, by Philip Keller, and it's called The Songs of Jesus, and it's all it takes you through the Psalms in one year. And it's very interesting. On uh, uh, Thursday, uh, it was in uh, Psalm 83, verses 1 through 8, where it says, O oh God, do not remain silent. Do not turn a deaf ear. Do not stand aloof, O God. Show how your enemies growl, how your foes rear their heads. With cunning, they conspire against your people. They plot against those who you cherish. Come, they say, let us destroy them as a nation so that Israel's name will be remembered no more. With one mind, they plot together. They form an alliance against you. The tents of Edom and of Tyre and even Assyria have joined them to reinforce Lot's or descendants. So uh, the commentary he has uh, rethinking your enemies. This is a psalm about enemies. How should you respond to them? The first verses say to God, see how your enemies growl and how your foes rear their heads? This perspective is crucial. All sin is fighting God's, usurping his authority, taking his place. Even believers must acknowledge that in every wrongdoing, they are making themselves God's enemies. Against you, you only have I sinned, it says in Psalm 51, verse number four. So if someone is wronging you, look at them primarily as someone who is at war with God. 
that will keep you from feeling alone against them. It will also comfort you to know that ultimately it is God's business to deal with them. So as we, uh, as we look at uh, this, this whole thing, we're looking at how to deal with the enemies of God. Now, since we're on God's side, right? Yes. How many are on God's side? Okay, we're on God's side. That means that literally his enemies are our enemies. So what we're going to do is we're going to look in these verses, verses 14 through 21, we're going to look at seven actions of a believer who loves others in difficult, discouraging, and evil times. So verse 14 tells us, number one, blessing. Blessing. It says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Tom Schreiner said, in this injunction to bless those who persecute us is one of the most revolutionary statements in the New Testament and can be carried out only by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus' teaching on this subject is from the Sermon on the Mount. The Apostle Paul is thinking about what Jesus has said to his disciples. It, it says there in Matthew chapter 5, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And you may be sons of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who hate you or love those who love you, what reward will get will it get you? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect. In other words, be mature. Therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. And so Jesus' injunction is that those people who are enemies of God, we are to befriend them. And we are to, to ask a blessing upon those people. That's verse 14. Verse 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And that is empathizing. I would say sympathizing, but it's really empathizing. Whenever you sympathize uh, with somebody, what do you do? You show them pity. But when you empathize, you can rejoice with them or you can weep with them. Whatever their mood, whatever their emotion, whatever their problems are, you can take those problems on yourself. But not only their problems, you can take their joys as well. You can rejoice with those people. And so it's empathizing. One of the old uh, pastors, uh, the right after the, uh, uh, the, the first uh, uh, year in, in the church, John Chrysostom, uh, in his homilies on uh, the book of Romans says, uh, uh, it may well be right in remarking that the admonition to rejoice with those who rejoice occurs first because it's the most difficult. And he goes on to say, we're all inclined to shed a sympathizing tear to those who are suffering, but envy and a sense of competition often hinder us from truly rejoicing with those who rejoice. It's easier to feel sympathy for someone than to feel joy whenever something good is occurring in their life. Somebody comes in and says, I just received $10,000 in the mail. I don't know where it came from, but the check was made out to me and I took it to bank and cashed it. And I've got $10,000 in my bank account. Aren't you happy about that? Most of us say, that's no big deal. Who cares? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's really tough sometimes in those situations. Joseph Bailey, uh, a Christian author, uh, wrote a book uh, a few years ago. He says, the last thing we talk about, Joseph and his wife had seven children, and it, it was in a very unfortunate kind of circumstances. Three of those children died. And when this occurred, 
He said, I was sitting torn by grief. Someone came and talked to me about God's dealing and why it happened of hope beyond the grave. He talked constantly. He said things I knew were true. I was unmoved except to wish he'd go away. He finally did. Another man came and sat beside me. He didn't talk. He didn't ask me leading questions. He just sat beside me for an hour or more and listened when I said something, answered briefly, prayed simply, and left. I was moved. I was comforted. I hated to see him go. To empathize with someone is a difficult thing, and we need the power of the Holy Spirit to help us be able to do that effectively. The mercies of God call on us to sympathize with others, empathize with others in both their joys and in their sorrows. The Arabs have a custom which symbolizes uh, what's called for here. They touch their head, they touch their lips, and they touch their heart, indicating, I think highly of you, I speak well of you, my heart breaks for you. A sorrow shared is but half a trouble. A joy that's shared is a joy made double. I like that little verse, don't you? So the, the third thing is humbling, humbling yourself in verse number 16. Be the same mind towards one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do, uh, do not be wise in your own estimation. I remember that Bob Utley came out to Nevada to do a January Bible study tour with me. He's a Bible scholar. In fact, uh, he has uh, on, on the internet, you can, you can look at his entire commentary on the Bible, and it is thorough. Well, he came out to help us, and uh, as we were driving around the state and talking, uh, he had this, this wonderful phrase. He said, Terry, in my humble but accurate opinion, and then he would give you his opinion. And uh, uh, so, and, and he, of course, that was basically in jest. But, you know, there are people that think their humble but accurate opinion is just that, humble and accurate. And that's a pretty scary kind of thing. There, there is this idea that we have to be humble. Leon Morris, in his commentary on Romans, said, A person who is wise in his own eyes is rarely so in the eyes of other people. Even some unbelievers have figured this out. Jay Leno, when asked uh, what the, serv uh, the secret for his long marriage was, he said in Parade Magazine, all the way back in 2012, he said, if you don't fool around, it's not that hard. He said, I think the key to life is low self-esteem. Believing you are not the smartest or most handsome person in the room. All the people who have high esteem are criminals or actors. <laughs> now, that's a, that's a pretty important phrase. All the people who think highly of themselves are either criminals or actors. That's really sobering, isn't it? That's really sobering. Here's some practical realism from the book of Proverbs. Hatred stirs up dissension, but love covers all wrongs. A feel shows his annoyance at once, but a prudent man overlooks an insult. Fools mock at making amends for sin, but goodwill is found among the upright. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. He who covers over his offense promotes love, and whoever repents the matter separates close friends. Starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam, so drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. An angry man stirs up dissension. Do not be wise in your own estimation, comes from Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 7. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. So number four, considering. 
Look what it says in verse 17. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. Never pay back evil for evil. Ray Stedman tells a story about uh, some officers in uh, the Korean War. They were, were stationed in Seoul, and they uh, uh, they rented a house, and they, they hired a Korean houseboy to uh, take care of it. And uh, being a bunch of, of young men, almost college-age guys, they, uh, they started playing practical jokes on their houseboy. One day, they nailed his shoes to the floor. <laughs> and uh, uh, they they put a bucket over over the the door you know how to do that you open a door just a little bit set a bucket of water up there and when you open the door the bucket of water comes and falls down on your head and they they thought that was the greatest thing in the world this poor little house boy they finally said you know we're, we've been really mean to this guy so they went to him and they said, we want to apologize to you. And we're not going to nail your shoes to the floor anymore. We're not going to put a bucket of water up. He said, no water on door? And they said, no water on door. He said, okay, I no longer spit in soup. <laughs> <laughs> now that's revenge. That's revenge. And re recognize that that when we when we do something to hurt someone else, their natural reaction is revenge. Our natural reaction is revenge. And Paul is saying, no more revenge, because it doesn't help you love an enemy of the cross. So consider. And then the, the fifth thing is peacemaking. Verse number 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. The whole world is festering with unhappy souls. The French hate the Germans. The Germans hate the Poles. The Italians hate the Yugoslavs. South Africans hate the Dutch. And I don't like anybody very much. Have you ever thought of that? how we are, are siloing ourselves away from the people that God wants us to tell about the love of Jesus. His enemies, our enemies, that he wants to become his children in a very special way. And we have the opportunity to help bring them to that. So number six is surrendering. Verse number 19, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. The prohibition of vengeance is found in both old, the Old Testament and then as the, the Jews continued on, even till this day, this is, is one of the, the prohibitions that Jews look at. Vengeance is found, uh, a, a prohibition of vengeance is found in the Old Testament, and Jews still practice it today. It tends to be confined to the relations with co-religionists. In other words, so very often, we recognize that we shouldn't we we shouldn't take out vengeance on anybody that's not like us we wouldn't want anybody to in our church to take vengeance out on any other member of our church would we but yet so often it's just limited to that little special group that we're a part of doug moo says uh, though redeemed and citizens of heaven, we believers still live in a world soaked by evil. We must battle against the tendency to conform our behavior to this world. But more than the purely negative quality of resistance to evil is needed. God calls on us to be active in using the grace of the gospel and the power of the spirit to win victories over the evil of this world. That's what we're to be about surrendering ourselves to the will of God, letting him take the vengeance that's needed. I, I want to refer again to Phil Keller's uh, devotional guide. On June, uh, July 22nd, he said, read uh, uh, Psalm 83, 9 through 13. Do to them as uh, you did to Midian, as you did to Sisera and Jabin and the river 
at the river Kishon, who perished at Endor, became like dung on the ground. Make your nobles like Oreb and Zeb, all their prisoners like Zeba and Zalumna, who said, let us take possession of the pasture lands of God. Make them like tumbleweed, my God, like chaff before the wind. I mean, here it is. The, the Israelites are saying, God, you have a bunch of enemies and we want you to take care of them. We want you to beat them up. We want you to step on their fingers. We want you to break their teeth. We don't want any of these people to get away without your wrath. Now, all through the book of Psalms, we have these imprecatory psalms, these psalms with an imprecation. In other words, curse your enemies. But you know something? The psalmists never talk about, I'm going to go exact revenge on my enemies. What the psalmist says is, God, you take care of. You take care of the situation. Now, they use some pretty harsh language whenever they describe what they want God to do to them. But ultimately, what they're saying is, it's in your hands, God. It's not in ours. So surrendering ourselves to the will of God means that we can allow God to take charge. How do we respond to imprecatory psalms that ask God to destroy enemies instead of forgiving them? We should recognize something important here, namely that even in the Old Testament, the psalmist is not trying to take revenge himself. These psalms then allow us to turn our anger over to God for him to act as he sees fit and align us with Paul's advice not to take revenge, dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. Once you uh, relocate your enemies, taking them out of your hands and putting them in God's, you may find yourself developing sympathy for them. Ultimately, no one will get away with anything. So the last thing is helping. Verse number 20. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Burning coals on his head. What in the world does that mean? Uh, and people have come up with all kinds of, of solutions. Almost every commentary has some sort of idea. Fire of God's wrath and judgment. That's the fire on the head. Uh, fire of shame or embarrassment. Fire of blessing like coals given to a neighbor who needs a fire. The Egyptian ritual where a penitent would carry coals on their head as a sign of their repentance. But again, the commentators that, that really uh, drill down to a, a meaning we can understand, there's been much scholarly speculation as to what the final phrase regarding burning coals means. I'm confident that the oldest and simplest explanation is best. In doing good for our enemies, we hurt burning pangs of shame and contrition on their head, which hopefully, not surely, will lead them to God's grace. Fire In uh, Psalm 83, as fire consumes a forest or a flame, uh, sets a mountain ablaze, so pursue them with your tempest and terrify them with your storm. Cover their faces with shame so they will seek your name. May they ever be ashamed and dismayed. May they perish in disgrace. Let them know that you whose name is the Lord, that you alone are the most high over all the earth. The psalmist seems to want only death for his enemies, but the surprise in verses 14 through 16 is his prayer that wrongdoers be brought to see the truth and come to know God's name. And so helping others is to bring them to a point where they're confronted with the reality of a God who loves them. So the conclusion, verse number 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Our text closes with